All right, how many people are ready for the word today? Amen, the word? Well, if you have your Bibles, it's going to be Hebrews chapter 11. Now, this is going to be part two, part two of the message. It's supposed to say part two, even though it says part one. So just in your, imagine it's saying part two, and uh, we'll, go, we'll go from there. And the reason why is because I want to make sure that, um, that we take our time as we go through. This is a very, very important chapter in the Bible, uh, it, more specifically, a chapter that builds our faith. We want to build your faith with the things of the Lord. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray now your blessing to be upon your people as they receive the word today. We pray, so Lord God, that you would be glorified as uh, the word goes forth and people are encouraged to, uh, to live their life full of faith, knowing that there have been many others who have gone before and done the very same thing. Father, we want to show ourselves faithful to you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. So if you haven't guessed, today's message is about faith. The word behind me is the word of the day, faith. And we're going to talk about that. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony. And here's the testimony, that he pleased God. How many people want to have a testimony that you please God. How many people don't want to be the kind of people that when you wake up in the morning, God goes, oh no, they're getting up, you know? Maybe the devil can feel that way, but certainly not the Lord, right? And so Enoch was a guy that pleased God. Now, you should know that the Bible gives us a limited view of Enoch, but what we can gather from his life with the information that we do have is that he was a man of God, who walked in a right relationship with God in the pre-flood world. He is the sixth of 10 pre-flood patriarchs of our faith. Now the word taken, and by the way, I'm using the New King James Version. In the New King James Version, the word taken is the word that's used. It's rendered translated translated as the King James Version. So some of your Bibles might say that he was translated. Now the Greek for translation, metatithmi, and uh, that's the word, and it is used twice in this verse. Its meaning is to transfer to another place, to translate, to be taken. Now this is another Old Testament picture of a New Testament rapture where a righteous man is taken before God's impending judgment. In this case, the judgment was the universal flood. Let's go there quickly in Genesis chapter 5. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Now, the book of Jasher, although not considered to be a part of the canon of Scripture, has a more detailed picture of Enoch in that he was like Elijah, a prophet to the people of his day. And when wickedness ruled the planet, Enoch was God's man and his voice to the people. And the Bible talks about how when Enoch, in, in not the Bible, the book of Jasher talks about how when Enoch was taken up, he was taken up in a whirlwind just like Elijah was. Now we don't have that accounting in, in the Bible, but we see it in Jasher. And so there's a connection between Enoch and Elijah. Now in Bible prophecy, that will mean something to you. But for the purpose of this message, I want you to see this man of God who was taken up by God for a purpose. Both Enoch and Elijah were righteous men of faith. They walked with God and were used by God to be his voice to, his gen to their generation. Both never died, but were raptured into heaven in a whirlwind. Here's the question. I wonder if we'll see those guys again. You wonder if we'll see them again? We'll see them again. Well, we'll see them from a different viewpoint. That's a sermon for another time. Let's move on to verse 6 if you have your Bibles. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who's the him? Anybody? God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that God is, must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How many people know that God wants 
to reward you. He wants to bless you. He wants to, to give you favor, unmerited favor. And we can have that as we diligently seek God and as we pursue God, as Tom Tenney would say, as we chase God. This is uh, our, our desire for the things of the Lord. And here we have a standalone statement that challenges all believers in Jesus to not only have a faith in God through Jesus Christ, but to maintain that faith in God because God is a rewarder of all who diligently seek him. And sometimes those rewards manifest on this side of the veil, and always, and we know this by faith, they'll manifest on the other side of the veil as well. So don't lose heart. This verse not only encourages us to have and develop our faith in God, but it gives us an incentive that one day we will be rewarded for our faithfulness by God. All of us want to be able to come before the Lord at the Bema Seat and have the Master say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know, uh, the Apostle Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5. He said, I, uh, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He's speaking of a future glory even though he suffers on this side of the veil. Paul the Apostle said it this way in Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, we all walk by faith and we all look forward to the reward that God has promised to us in glory. If I can just encourage you today, if you're going through a difficult season in your life, perhaps you're going through a time that's very tenuous or stressful or maybe uncertain, I want to encourage you not to lose your faith, but to recognize that God has a reward for you. He wants to manifest part of that reward on this side of the veil. But there's a great reward that awaits you on the other that nobody can take away. So I want to encourage you just to stand firm, have faith, and recognize that as we move forward, we do so by faith, knowing that in the end, God will be glorified in what we say and do. Verse 7 says this, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark, for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Now you should know that Noah's whole purpose, purpose, person or purpose uh, was moved to obey the Lord. His mind was warned of God, his heart was moved with fear, and his will acted on what God told him by faith. May we be people like Noah, who our purpose uh, is we, we are moved to obey God, our full person, that our minds uh, listen to the voice of the Spirit and our heart moves with fear and our, our, our will is to do what God tells us to do by faith. You see, nobody had ever seen a flood or rain or any large body of water as a threat to their person or property until the flood came. Now, the book of Jasher, again, has a detailed account of the Ark of Noah the unloading process, the protection of the ark, and the pending flood. Jasher says it took Noah five years to construct the ark. Now, the Bible doesn't give us a clear picture, but only that it was built for the purpose of saving the righteous souls and beasts of the earth. One person said it this way, Well, Pastor Rob, there wasn't enough room for everybody in the world to be on that ark. So therefore, even if the people did repent, well, then they couldn't have all fit on the ark. They would have died anyway. But see, here's the deal. The answer to that is this. If God knew that they, would have, they were going to repent, he would have had more arcs constructed. You see, God sees everything. He knows everything. He knew who would choose to repent and who wasn't going to repent. And so he simply prepared for that. Now, I want to encourage you. We don't teach predestination around here, but we do teach the sovereignty of God, that he knows everything, okay? And he gives us the opportunity to make choices for ourselves. God has provided for you enough sustenance and resource for you to have everything that you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And don't you ever forget it. Don't be this type of person that says, well, God doesn't love me. He doesn't care for me because if he did, then why am I going through such a difficult time? But we recognize that sometimes we go through difficulties so God can show himself strong within the difficulty. Also, when things go good, we really appreciate it because we know what it feels like when they don't. 
So I just want to encourage you to get a good perspective on what is happening here with Noah. You see, Noah's faith saved his family, but it condemned the rest of the pre-flood world because Noah's faith revealed their unbelief the same way your righteous faith reveals the unbelief of those secular people that you associate with, including your family. I don't know if you know this or not, but Sometimes when you show up to a family party, other people in your family aren't really excited that you're there. I don't know if you have that problem or not. They're like, what is that person doing here? Oh, my goodness. Okay, whatever. I guess we'll have to go in the back room to drink. You know? <laughs> the point that I'm making is this. The righteousness of Christ is within you. That means that you bring that righteousness wherever you go. That's a conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. In a way, there's a condemnation that goes with it because for people who receive Christ, they're saved from that condemnation. But for those who reject, they're condemned already. Romans chapter 8 gives a pretty clear picture of that. This is why there is sometimes tension when you're with people who don't have faith in God through Jesus. You see, your faithfulness threatens their faithlessness because even though they may not believe, unless they repent, they too, just like the pre-flood world, will be condemned. And somehow they kind of know it. And that's part of the problem of why when we show up to a party, there's a little bit of a difference. Nobody cares if a Buddhist guy shows up or a Muslim or, or a, you know, maybe a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. Nobody cares about somebody who might be a monk or something else. But when a born-again, spirit-filled Christian shows up, there's some power there. And with that power brings a level of conviction that people recognize. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but a long time ago, there was a guy by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. How many people know that name, Smith Wigglesworth? He was an apostle of faith. He was a man of God who had a tremendous anointing on his life. And if you read books on Smith Wigglesworth, as I have, you read stories about how he would walk into a factory or into a place and people would be convicted of the Spirit because the Spirit of God was so heavy on his life that it would just uh, draw, draw it, would, it would be, um, it would overwhelm people as they, they would walk. May that be our portion as well, that when you walk into a place, people recognize that you're a man or a woman of God and you walk with that kind of faith and spiritual authority. That's who God's called us to be. Amen? Now, this section of the faith chapter focuses on the nation of Israel, a nation which began with the calling of Abram, later Abraham, and his wife Sarah, and the family that would come from their loins. Do you guys know what loins are? Anybody know what that is? because I'm taking my dog to the vet tomorrow to get neutered. Now, I need to explain that to you. I want you to know when we talk about loins, we're talking about those things that come from our body. But you know the story as well as I do. Well, why don't we read it here in, in 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Has anybody here ever gone out not knowing where you're going? You just kind of go? Anybody at all? How many people ever, I don't know, drive that way? Perhaps you do your books that way. Perhaps that's the way you live your life. I'm recalled of the time I was helping one of you fix something, and I wasn't sure what you were doing. I think the statement I made was, I'm not sure what you're doing, but I'm helping you to do it. So we want to make sure that we know where we're going. But sometimes we don't know where we're going. And when that happens, we're going by faith. That's okay. That's what Abraham did. Verse 9 says this. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, although chosen by God to be the father of the chosen people, Israel, Abraham had to take the first step, which is to get out from among his people and go to a place where God was calling him to go. Genesis 12, 1 says this. Now, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. This was the command of God. His invitation to Abraham to join God working in another area. And in this case, it was the land of Canaan. 
Now, God is always working. He's working everywhere. And when he invites us to join him in his work, we must be obedient to his call. That often means that we have to stop doing what we're doing in one area and go and join God working in another area. That's what happens. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 say this. And this is God speaking to Abram. He says, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the promise of God to Abram. If he obeyed God and accepted his invitation to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to go to this other place, Canaan, God always gives us an inheritance for obeying him. It's his blessing on our lives because of our faithfulness to him. Now, some of you folks need to really see what this looks like. So what you need to do is look at older believers, older Christians who have been faithful to the Lord their entire lives or since they were saved. And look at their lives. Look at the blessing of God upon their life. Look at the provision and protection of God upon their life. Look how the sovereign Lord of glory continues to bestow blessing so that younger Christians can look at them and say, wow, if I remain faithful to God, that's going to be my inheritance too one day as well. But more than that, more importantly than that is the blessing that waits for us on the other side. That's the real encouragement. And I want to encourage you with that as well. Verse 4 says this. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed for Haran. Now this was Abraham obeying God. By acting out his faith and doing what God told him to do. You see, when we obey God, we demonstrate our faith in God. Our obedience to God's word in our lives and for our lives is the litmus test of our faith in action. Are you acting in obedience to what God has called you to do? That is the test. If you're a man or woman of faith, it's always going to show up in how you are obeying the Lord. Am I acting in obedience to the Father? Am I doing the thing that God has called me to do? Verse 11 says this, By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Let's break this down. As you recall, Sarah was 90 years old, and Abraham was 100 when she conceived Isaac. Both were too old to have kids, yet both believed that God would perform the miracle of a son because God promised them, and God is faithful to his word. Unbelief asks, how can this be? Faith asks, how shall this be? Let that marinate a little bit, because some of you are asking God for things, and you're not sure how it's going to manifest, and really, you need to stop and say, how shall this be? In other words, it shall be, how is that? Sarah, even though she was unsure of her own strength, she was sure of God's strength, and judged God to be faithful to his promise to her. Listen up, folks. If God says to you that he's going to do something, He's going to do it. So if you're ever in a situation where you're unsure about a circumstance or situation and you go to your Bible and you read specifically where there is a promise that God has given to you, you need to believe that God is going to follow through on his promise. You just need to be that kind of a person who has that kind of faith. Because there's going to be times when we have to, by faith, simply rely on God's word to us and act in obedience to what he has called us toward. We've got to go to this place. Verse 12 says this, Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. You see, the one man mentioned here is Abraham, the old, good as dead, impotent version of Abraham. And God promised Abraham that his descendants will be as many as the stars of the sky and innumerable as the sand on the seashore. That's a pretty tall order to be promising a man who has lost his, how shall we say this, tilmescent glow. Think about that. Verse 13 says this, 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were assured of them, embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Now, this may not seem like a lot for people that are reading the book of Hebrews or even the book of Genesis, but when you get to the book of Revelation, you want to make sure that you are not being classified with the group of people who, quote, dwell on earth, unquote. You see, our dwelling place isn't here on earth. Our dwelling place is in the kingdom of heaven. We live here temporary, like a tent. Some of you guys have nicer tents than others. Some of you live in apartment tents. Some of you live in house tents. Some of you live in tent trailers. You see where I'm going with this. But our home is in heaven. This is a dwelling place. We're passing through this land. So don't get too attached to your stuff because it's all gonna burn one day, right? Come on now. See, the Old Testament saints were just that. They were Old Testament saints. They lived under a flawed system of sacrifices that when they finally died, they were ushered into the lower parts of the earth to a place called Abraham's bosom. They died not having received the promises, God's promises of the Messiah and the blessing that he would bring. However, they were assured of them and confessed them by faith, knowing that their home was in heaven. Now, how like today, we must make a similar confession of faith. But our faith is in Jesus, who is God's promised Messiah, who's already come to the earth. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life. He died on a cross for the sin of humanity, and he resurrected three days later. Folks, let me just tell you something. There are deists that believe that a man, Jesus Christ, walked the face of the earth, died on a cross, but they just don't recognize him as the son of God. And that's a problem because history can tell us about a person, but we have to believe by faith that that person was exactly God incarnate, God in the flesh. And that's what we as Christians believe. And if you don't believe that, you can't go forward. You've got to cross that bridge first before you move on. It wasn't that Jesus was just some guy. He was the son of God. Not just a historical figure, but he was deity, God in flesh. We have to recognize that. It's so important. If we are New Testament saints, then we have faith. And by faith, we make the good confession in Christ. We invite Jesus to be the Lord of our life. We ask him to come into our life and forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from our unrighteousness and give us the power of the Spirit to live righteously. This is what the salvation experience is all about. Verses 13 through 16 say this. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they have called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, these patriarchs of our faith, although lived in temporary dwellings, they look for the heavenly country a spiritual homeland, a city prepared by God just for them. How like today, believers still seek that same city whose builder and maker is God. Some people believe that this city is not a real city, but a metaphorical city. However, John the Revelator has not only seen the city, but he described it in detail as a very real place for all New Testament saints to behold and look forward to dwelling in. If you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 21, he describes it this way. He had a vision, and in the vision, the angel of the Lord carried him away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed him gr the, the great city of the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Um, also, she had a great... And high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And the names written on them were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And, and he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. 
The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. He had measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So it's like a big cube. And by the way, 12,000 furlongs is 1,377 miles squared. Do the math. Let's read on. Then he measured its wall, 140 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third, I can't pronounce it, the fourth emerald, the fifth sarnix, the, the sixth star, sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth, can't pronounce that one, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls, and each uh, individual gate was of one pearl. This is where we get the phrase, the pearly gates. And the street of the city was pure gold. This is where we get golden streets, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need for the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there's no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to submit to you that the city that the Hebrew writer was talking about in Hebrews chapter 11 is a very real city. It is a literal city, not just a metaphorical city or an allegorical city. It was created by God and it occupies both time and space. You should know that it is a central part of the promised eternal dwelling place of all who have received Jesus by faith into their heart as their personal Lord and Savior. That's what we like to call salvation. We must be saved to have our name written in the Lamb's book of life. We have to make that choice to receive Jesus. Worship team, come on up here. That is to say, if you're not saved and you have not proclaimed Christ as Lord and received his forgiveness for your sin, then you're not going to this celestial city because this city, the New Jerusalem, is only for those who have called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. So the Hebrew writer is referencing all the way back to Genesis, all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, all the way back to the beginning of the Jewish nation, which would later become the Christian nation through Christ. And he's letting them know there's a city that we're shooting for in the future. Now I'll give you the Rob Lee crash course on what that looks like. The rapture of the church occurs there's a seven-year tribulation period where Christ returns with his church to retake the earth. For 1,000 years, the earth is recycled under the governance of Jesus Christ himself and the millions of people who are in his stead. This city will be in space above the earth, but not on the earth yet. Then at the end of the 1,000 years, there's a final rebellion when the devil is released. And then in that time, God will defeat the devil permanently and he will institute what we call the great white throne judgment where all the dead from the beginning of time all the way forward are judged by God and cast into the lake of fire, which the Bible says is the second death. Then the Lord will renovate this earth with fire. And the picture is, is that when he renovates it, he recreates a new earth. And when that new earth is recreated, then this glorious city will come down and establish itself on this new earth. That's what John is seeing. It's coming out of heaven. He's seeing this picture. You and I will have access to the city, but we'll have access to go all kinds of places like heaven or the new earth or wherever we wanna go. This is the promise that God has given to us. A lot of people when I talk like this, they're like, what in the world? Is this for real? Or is this guy reading too many Star Trek books? Trust me, Gene Roddenberry has got nothing on the promises of God. You need to know this. The reason why I feel like the Lord is trying to have me share this with you is because we live by faith. If this is what I'm telling you is in God's words, which by the way it is, then it's real. 
It's as real as our faith. It's as real as his word. The question is, are you in proper alignment to receive it? Because if you're not, you don't get this. A lot of people want the goodies of God, but they don't want relationship with God. That doesn't work with God. He wants you. Sure, he's got blessing. Of course he does. And there's a lot of people that don't have God that have blessing, but their blessing is temporary. Trust me when I tell you this. There are a lot of rich people that have all kinds of stuff, and then they hit the grave. They were a big shot for a minute, as one man said. But now it's over. We don't want to have that plight for us. We want to live right now, righteously right now, and we are looking for the end game. Amen? We're excited about that.